Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now we are in full Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus, in secula. I'm Timothy S. Flanders, this is The Meaning of Catholic. The last time on the show, we talked about the thing that you need to get yourself through this crisis and how to survive and die a Catholic. The first thing is to take up your cross manfully like a saint. Today we're going to talk about the second thing you need to get yourself through, but first we're going to talk about a little news. So last Sunday, the Holy Father canonized St. John Henry Cardinal Newman. Now, I haven't seen any controversy about the canonization itself. Uh, we've had controversial canonizations before, but this particular man is a man of God recognized by many as a great scholar of the faith, great holiness, a poet, a musician, uh, a great man of the 19th century, the uh, first fruit, perhaps, of the blood of all the English martyrs of our fathers who shed their blood, the pilgrimage of grace, the English uprising um, that shed their blood seemingly for nothing, but finally this fruit came of this 19th century movement of Anglicans returning to the one true faith. And now we have the Anglican Ordinariate. So St. John Henry Newman is not a, a controversial saint in the sense of his holiness, um, but one of, the, the, one of the things that he's most famous for is the development of doctrine. Now, we went, we, a few months ago we did an article on Newman because what was interesting was that he was timed, the canonization was timed at the same time as the Amazon Synod in October. And it seemed pretty clear that they were going to use this to promote their heresies. Uh, so we're going to quick talk about the very strong distinction between, on the one hand, the evolution of dogma, which is a modernist heresy, and on the other hand, the development of dogma from Newman, which is orthodox. So, <clears throat> we'll check out our Ott, Ludwig Ott. This is a book you need to have. This book is, any good seminary is going to have this book. It's a basic textbook of all the dogmas and also their theological note. So in the very beginning, Ott lays out and distinguishes between the heretical notion of development of dogma and the orthodox one. So he quotes one of the biggest modernist heretics uh, was Alfred Loisy. And he said in, the, in uh, 1903, he said, As progress in science or philosophy demands a new concept of the problem of God, so progress in historical research gives rise to a new concept of the problem of Christ and the Church. And so the First Vatican Council anathematized this proposition with this anathema. If anyone shall say, as knowledge progresses, at times, a meaning is to be given to dogmas of the church different from the one that the church has understood and understands. Let him be anathema. So what this is saying is, is that the meaning cannot change in substance. And Ott makes, it, makes the distinction between the material point of dogma and the formal. So when he's talking about the material, he's talking about the stuff of the dogma, the revelation, the deposit of faith. That has been deposited into the, uh, given to the church, and it's final. The revelation has, has been deposited, it's done. That's the matter, that's the stuff. And then on the other hand, you have the formal aspect of dogma. And the formal aspect of dogma is the form that it takes, uh, the ways that it becomes explicit, the implications that are brought out of this. Um, every truth of dogma is at least contained by implication in the deposit of faith. So this distinction, if we make this, if we draw these distinctions, we can take a look at the, the way that these are distinguished. So on the material side is the deposit of faith, formal is the deposit explained. Okay, so um, when something is explained, we're going to get into some examples in a second. Um, material, every truth is implicit, the formal is truth is made explicit. Uh, material also, there's disputed questions. People have been debating for hundreds of years on the Immaculate Conception, but then there's a definitive doctrine by the Magisterium that's the formal definition. So one of the best examples of this is the Council of Nicaea. So the Council of Nicaea, there was a debate over the Arian heresy, and what they did was they took the matter of the doctrine, 
the deposit of faith, which was that God and man were joined in one person, Jesus Christ, in two natures, God and man. And they created a new word of dogma, consubstantial, to express this. So this is a new form. It's definitely a change. It's a new form because there's something that form did not exist yet in the deposit of faith. And yet, it is the se of the same substance. It's the same meaning as what the Father said beforehand. It's the same meaning as the scriptures. So, w the, a good analogy is the, of this, when we talk about matter form, is simply if we're making a wooden chair, we've got wood, wood is the matter, the, the shape of the chair is what it is. That's the form that it takes. Now, you can't, t you can't make something concrete out of wood because... Wood is the matter. Wood is the substance. Now, in the same way, you cannot take a meaning and make it completely contrary to the former meaning. It has to be, the truths have to be consistent. So let's, let's look at a real-life example. So in, um, in Pope Francis's pontificate, uh, we have the change of the death penalty. So this, this dogma, this moral moral dogma was always understood by the church because it's explicit in Holy Scripture. God commands the death penalty to be inflicted on some for different penalties under the old law, and it was also affirmed in the new. And there's many other videos that can show this. Um, you can search. Taylor Marshall's video's got a good one on that. Um, Edward Fieser's got the book on death penalty if you want to look into this more. But the the basic idea is that the death penalty is admissible if conditions make it it is not intrinsically evil now the idea is that the the sense cannot change substantially so the when the cdf explained this explained what was going on now remember the anathema said from vatican one it said uh, if anyone says that the knowledge progresses because the knowledge progresses a sense needs to be given to a dogma different from what the church understands. So if we base any change based on, well, we just have better knowledge and we're going to alter completely the way that somebody is understood and so that it contradicts. So the, the initial teaching is the death penalty is permissible. It is admissible in certain cases. It is good. It is not intrinsically evil. That's the sense. But now the sense is it is inadmissible. It is contrary to human dignity. And, not only that, but they hinged this based right on a progress of knowledge. So the, the CDF explanation says, this development centers principally on the clear awareness of the church for the respect due to every human life. So they're, they're saying that it's not primarily about a change in condition. It's not about all the different modern technology or whatever. It's about a change in philosophy. And that is precisely what Alfred Wazi said. Alfred Wazi said, there's a change in philosophy, therefore we need to change the way that the church understands dogmas. So the CDF is essentially saying a very similar thing that apparently seems to be the same. And so we have this apparent contradiction where the CDF themselves are uh, proposing something based on an increase of knowledge to change substantially to contradict the understanding. So, what do we do as Catholics? Well, we have to have the virtue of piety. St. Thomas says the virtue of piety is what we owe to our elders, what we owe to our parents, owe to our superiors. We have to have the virtue of piety, and we look at any apparent error within the magisterium or any bishop or priest, we look at it with piety, with humility, and we try our best to understand it in an orthodox way, in a sympathetic way. That is what the virtue of piety teaches us to do. But... Sometimes, like in this instance, it is not reasonable for us to make the assertion that this is the same. It may be difficult for under, us to understand. There may be, we try as we might, honestly, we just can't really make these two go together because it seems like us to be 2 plus 2 equals 5. So what do we do then? Then we submit a dubia to the Pope. But we all know what happens when we do that. So, that's the situation that we're in. We're in a situation where so many of the different doctrines and dogmas have been questioned um, even before Vatican II. And so we have to ask the magisterium, what do you mean by this? Is this the same sense? 
And people have been asking the Magisterium for that, and there has been many clarifications, but what, what really is coming out is that there are a lot of ambiguities and gaps in this explanation. And it's particularly with Pope Francis, we don't get an explanation. And so this is the situation we're in. So we need to continue to pray. We need to understand what development of doctrine truly is. And then we can understand what is the heresy and what is the orthodox dogma. So <clears throat> next thing we talk about, next thing you need to do to get through this crisis, you need to read the most popular book of all time beside the Bible, and that is The Imitation of Christ. You don't not only need to read it, but then you need to practice what it says. The Imitation of Christ is like the Epistle of St. James. It's a kick in your teeth, mercilessly, every single day, that completely challenges your whole spiritual life and gives you that kick to get you going to do what's right, to take up the cross and suffer like a man. So, let's just read from the first chapter. Very first chapter. Chapter 1. What doth it avail thee to discourse profoundly of the Trinity if thou be void of humility, and consequently displeasing to the Trinity? In truth, sublime words make not a man holy and just, but a virtuous life maketh him dear to God. I would rather feel compunction than know its definition. If thou didst know the whole Bible by heart, and the sayings of all the philosophers, what would all profit thee without the love of God and his grace? And so, as faithful Catholics, we have a zeal for the Orthodox faith. We have a zeal for orthodoxy, for correct dogma. But we should never use that as a pretense for forsaking charity, humility. What you see online is that the internet allows us to sin against, the, against charity, against modesty and humility by saying all manner of evil things to our brethren about our superiors. We get away with this because of the internet it is, but we're not going to get away with that at the judgment seat. Because the Lord says that every word that comes from our mouth, we will give an account at the judgment seat. Do you fear God? Do you fear his judgments? then seek charity and humility. That is the purpose. That is the end. The end of all doctrine is beatitude, is the beatific vision. And charity is union with God. So we need to keep this in mind and always keep this. So that's why you need to read the imitation. This, this copy is what I recommend. This is a, a pocket copy. It's keep it in your pocket. Take it with you every single day. Every chapter takes about... 10 minutes or less to, to read. Just read a chapter a day and then just start over from the beginning after you're done. And then do what it says. You have to put it into practice or else this is nothing. So it reminds me of one of my favorite verses is uh, 1 John 4.20. And it says, If any man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he seeth, how can he love God whom he seeth not? This is a judgment on us, brethren. Let us not be ashamed of the judgment seat of Christ, but let us truly love our brother from the heart, forgive him, and love our enemies like true Christian men, taking up our cross, receiving the suffering from the Lord in this time of crisis, and rejoicing in that cross, because you know that by conforming yourself to Christ, you will conform to his glory. So lastly, I, I just want to talk about one last thing, and that is um, an article I, I wrote on 1 Peter 5. Um, it was on the rosary, right? Pl praying the rosary during the holy sacrifice. And I was really, I guess I was kind of surprised that it was one of the most controversial things I've, I've written on the internet. And it was just about how you pray the, how you can pray the rosary during holy mass and how you can meditate on the mysteries of the rosary and connect those with the parts of the mass. And I was just, I guess I was surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised, but um, praying the rosary during mass offends some people. And that is just ridiculous because here's why. Our fathers who shed their blood for the faith for centuries, they prayed the rosary during mass. They didn't, they weren't singing a bunch of hymns during mass. 
They were praying during Mass. They were praying their prayer books. They were doing all sorts of different things, whatever they did, to participate in the Holy Sacrifice. And there is this modern notion of active participation can be quickly construed into a spiritual error, wherein vocal prayer is somehow higher than mental prayer. And this is part of the liturgical reform, the way it got deformed. So uh, one of the things I want to point you to is that the article that I linked to on the website that explained a little bit more, I didn't have enough space to put it on 1 Peter 5. If you take a look at that, it explains some of the spiritual error behind the idea of active participation as sort of a higher form. Um, what, what's tragic is that the, the reforms under Pius XII and under Paul VI both sought to suppress all of the pious prayers of the faithful and force them all into a common vocal prayer. There's nothing wrong with common vocal prayer. It's great. But what we need to understand is that every soul is different. Every soul has different temperaments, um, different things that they connect with when they pray and what helps them pray. And it's perfectly fine for anyone to pray the rosary during the Holy Sacrifice or do different prayers as long as they keep charity with their brother and they don't unnecessarily distract their brother. But this is an instance where we need to have charity towards anybody who wants to pray the rosary to allow them to do that. So I just wanted to respond a little bit to some criticism on that. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to try that out if it's, especially if you have struggle with a lot of distractions during the Holy Mass. I, I, it helps me when I have my kids and I'm dealing with a lot of distractions. So try it out. Take a look at the article. I'll link it below. Um, and I hope that's helpful. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, next week we're going to have my friend and brother Jeremiah Bannister. He's going to come on the show. He is a former atheist and set of contest. He's going to talk about his journey. Um, if you want to donate to support our apostolate, always helps us. I got miles to feed. Take a look at Patreon for that. Uh, until then, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.